Liam Cunningham, welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. Thank you. Thanks yeah, for having me. It's great to have you here. Um, could you tell us a little bit first about the Dignity Exhibition? Uh, well, it kind of it kind of came around, it came about by uh, by mistake, really. I, I I've been taking photographs for a long time, and it's probably since my early twenties. Uh, but I've never shown them to anybody. Mm. I, I, well, friends and kind of whatever, and I've taken it. I'm pretty hard on myself. Um, so uh, I, I I carry my cameras everywhere, and I'm associated with uh, a wonderful charity called World Vision, and I, I've travelled uh, a little bit around Africa with them. Um, and um, and the Middle East, uh, and I take photographs. Uh, uh, one of the reasons being, I, I have a shite memory, right. so uh, it's it's only when I go back a year late and go, oh yeah yeah yeah, I I, I don't know what that is, but anyway, I, I do uh, like to take photographs. So um, they they've asked me, they they asked me to show them the, the photographs, and and when they saw them, they said, look, we could do something with these uh, to raise awareness of uh, the problems in in south sudan so um so we formulated this um small little exhibition of about uh, there's about 12 photographs mm. that have kind of been blown up and printed for the first time of of the people that i met and those people are the people in in south sudan and maybe what what is happening there well, it's it's the world's newest country. Two thousand and eleven, it was it, it was granted its flag, and they had the unfortunate luck of discovering oil. Right. And of course, uh, there's a there's a, a a term called a resource curse, which is basically you have factions fighting over control mm. of 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 the money, uh, and the president at the time fell out with the vice president, uh, and they turned on each other and a, a kind of civil war ensued mm. uh, and a third of the population have been uh, displaced or are refugees um about f over four million four and a half million i think people um and because they have been displaced and um, they can't grow their food it's a very fertile country they can't grow their food they can't uh, look after themselves so they need assistance from the rest of the world mm. um so it's a pretty there's a there's a, a kind of tentative ceasefire at the moment which can you know, unravel at any minute but um i kind of think that because it's the newest country on the planet mm. if we can't help them stabilize yeah. themselves what hope is there for the rest of the planet and you've been vocal on this in the saying that you know it is humanitarian and it is the right thing to do but there's also a self-interest in doing it to make these countries uh, more sufficient and, and more stable. Absolutely. I mean, this particular country is, as I say, it's got oil. It's got. It's on the mm. Nile. It's incredibly mm. fertile. Mm. It's not. It's not a place that we like. We saw the famine in Ethiopia and stuff yeah. like that. We've got. Uh, I mean, they're well capable of looking after themselves. But of course, uh, you follow the money and you see what's yeah. uh, uh, what's what's happening there. And, and you know, people accuse Africa of corruption and whatever. There's no place going to be corrupt unless they're offered the opportunity mm. to be corrupt. And that's generally speaking the West. I mean, we've had corruption here. We've had tribunals yeah. a whole lot, and we're supposed to be in inverted commas sophisticated mm. and and you know democratic and all that. Um, and so I mean, they need they need help. And one of the things we've got you've got to look at the big picture and and and, and take a step back. I mean, we've seen the trouble in the Med with the. Uh, uh, refugees and migrants coming from Libya because it's a because the West destroyed the country mm. and it, it became a failed state. Um, and what you've got here is, you know, if if, if South Sudan goes down geographically, you've got you know Sudan, uh, South Sudan, Sudan, Libya, and then the Med. Uh, and I talk to people in the World Food Programme over there, and, and and I mean, you just follow the the logical train of thought, and yeah. uh, and if these people can't, if we if they can't look after themselves, or we can't look after them. Um, there's there's very little reason why they wouldn't head north with their families yeah. to try and so I mean if we want a load of orange inflatables covering the med uh, we're going the right way about it. And World Vision are doing a lot around this. They're doing a, a, a cycle as well. I think in uh, in September aren't they? Paris Nice. There is a, there's a cycle coming up. If you want to mm. raise some money, uh, a lot of money, which and money always helps because I've I've seen the good that that it does. Uh, there's a um, Paris. Uh, there's a, a cycle leaving Paris in September, yeah. which I think will be led by Niall, the, the head of uh, World Vision here. And uh, if you wanted to get involved or donate, you can always go onto the website, 
and uh, um, and and to go back to the exhibition that you were talking yeah. about, I mean the, the the photographs that I have, they're 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 not uh, what's known apparently in the trade as fly in the eye shots, which is you know pitting up people in the midst of yeah. struggle yeah. and whatever. These are good news stories. Yeah. No, I've seen them. They're in the Paris Court Centre in town now. That's right, they? yeah. And you, you can see, yeah. they're, they're, I think that they're, they're nice photographs. Uh, and the, and I wanted to show the good work that World Vision does and also Irish Aid, which yeah. is the government side of this, uh, where the money is going. Because, uh, you know, it's very easy to be cynical about it and say, oh, the mo- you know, uh, th- there's thousands of them. We think in terms of numbers instead yeah. of individuals. So there's... Um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, th- these are the good news stories. And how long have you been working with World Vision? Oh, God, I don't know, um, f- t- four years, I suppose, right. something like that. So yeah, I did a little bit with the IRC before, yeah. um, in Greece, uh, with Syrian refugees, uh, and um, which I sh- we still do. I've been to Jordan with World Vision to see those poor unfortunates. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you've got you've to do something, especially with the the temporary bit of notoriety that I have at the moment. Right. So uh, i got to use it while, while, while still people are still are not sick of me. Is that uh, how you see it? A temporary bit of... It's of always notoriety. temporary. Is it? It's always temporary. Where else? Uh, of course it is. Yeah. Uh, and so it should be. I mean, it's, you know, the torch has to be passed. To, you know, somebody gave me the baton for a couple of years and then it'll be... It'll be passed on to somebody else yeah. afterwards. Yeah, don't worry. My my ego is big enough to to live with the <laughs> temporary nature of celebrity. And do you find it like is is doing stuff like this uh, a necessary kind of corrective? Like, how do you find fame? Like, what is it? Is it is it? Somebody once said to me, the fame who was somebody who was famous said, mm. fame is a pain in the arse. Oh uh, no, it, it is a pain in the arse. But uh, but listen, you also. Uh, you don't have to book good restaurants three months in advance. Yeah, right. Um, uh, you do. You get the you get the odd free jacket and short and whatever it may be. Um, listen, it has its benefits. I had. Uh, I'm sure people think I'm. I have been accused of of, of living in a gated community in Hollywood, <laughs> uh, on a, which makes me smile regularly. Yeah. And I've been accused of being a multi-millionaire because I'm I'm a, a, in the uh, the biggest show on the planet. Mm. It doesn't quite work like that. There's business side of things, the right. unglamorous side of it. Yeah. Um, but however, I did have uh, th- just uh, th- only a couple of months ago. The lovely people. I do like fast cars. I can't afford one, but I do like them. Uh, and I did have a, a kind of fame moment a couple of weeks ago. I live in Colchester, and, and it was wonderful to uh, to see a lorry back up my little cul-de-sac and. Yeah. Uh, um, a low loader, and when the when the when the curtains went up on the side of it, there was a, a purple Lamborghini <laughs> delivered to me for right. it. Uh, but I, I, I mean, people saw me driving around town and went, "Look at that rich bastard!" or whatever. <laughs> I had it for a week, right, and they okay. took it back. But there were, were they people abusing you for that week? Did you get a Do you get to get a sense of what what you know the people of Dublin think of you when you drive around in a purple oh, Lamborghini? Oh, listen, oh, listen, it's like, happened before. Do, do, do they acclaim you for it? They say, "Well, fair play," on, yeah. or, or do they say? I did, you know what? I did have uh, I, I, the the last time I there's a huge amount of goodwill, but people want to latch onto somebody saying you're yeah, bollocks or whatever. Yeah, you yeah. Know. But uh, I was I was asked to be be the grand marshal at at uh, yeah. uh, at the Patrick's Day parade, which I immediately rang my mother up uh, about as soon as I heard. Uh, it, it it was an incredible incredible honor for your own uh, mm. you know city to be t- to to say do you want to be the grand marshal. And you can only do that once in your lifetime. And I t- somebody did say, you know, what, what would you prefer, an Oscar? Or, and, and I said, to be honest with you, the Grand Marshal, you can win an Oscar every year. You can only be the Grand Marshal once. <laughs> and when I was going along in the, in the back of this freezing cold Rolls Royce, yeah. uh, open top thing, uh, there was, a, there was a, a few people along the way were kind of good on your limo and blah, blah, blah. And, and that's kind of hardening. You kind of you kind of feel a little bit like a representative of yeah. your socioeconomic bracket. Yeah. Um, and th- and th- that was quite gratifying. But listen, uh, uh, there's a there's a, th- a thing I t- sort of try to live by, which is what other people think of me is none of my business. Mm. Um, uh, and I I try to I try to remind myself of that. And what do you think of yourself when you when you find yourself in those positions? It's really odd. It's really odd. I mean, I went to the I went to the Emmys for the first time. Uh, um, just uh, whatever it was, the last the last time we won mm. best drama, which which nobody thought we would win, um, and it's kind of it's odd, it's odd to be there. It's a TV show, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's you know they don't call Hollywood Tinsel Town for nothing, um, 
and you are you're part of a, a television show and and uh, but it, it's really nice you know you, you have to you have to strip all away mm. all the bullshit we're st- uh, you know as an actor you're a storyteller try and tell the good stories yeah. and uh, um and it, the mathematics are kind of simple in it what do you mean we're storytellers. Yeah, we're yeah. just, you know, you, if, with a bit of luck, you come across occasionally something, uh, not even occasionally, very infrequently of something like Game of Thrones. And when, you know, I've been in this game a long time. And when you're turning the page and you're going, oh, this is mm. incredible storytelling. Um, that's kind of the thing you want to be part of. Yeah. You don't, you, I, I try and avoid being apologetic for stuff that's actually shite. Um, so I try and avoid doing them because it, it hurt, it cuts me to the quick. To try and sell something that you're not proud of, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it, that, there's no difficulty with Game of Thrones with it, because it's it's beautifully written and great storytelling. And is it a, like you know you've a, there's a series coming out this year? Like, mm. is it something that you have to be careful of? People, you know, asking you questions about it. Does that become a, a dra- you know a drain? To like pain in the hole trying to keep the secret. Is it? Yeah, I don't like it. I don't Does like. Does anyone be tell anyone? Cues. I haven't told anyone. No. No, not even. Well, uh, you know what? My, even my, my family aren't interested in knowing because we all sit on the sofa. We yeah. we watch it like fans. Yeah. And you have to remember, it's such a huge cast that I'm only there when I'm filming my bits. Right. Um. So I get I you know even though I know all the scripts and know what happens and blah blah blah, but uh. So uh, when I sit down, I'm sitting down like a fan. Mm. I'm a fan of the show yeah. because it's it's gorgeous written and and the people I work with are are just like top of the range people at what they do. So mm. I want to see what they've done and. Uh, yeah, I've uh, yeah, I, I, I do. I really enjoy watching it, and and also it's the, you know, everybody worth their salt in the game, and I mean behind the camera as well wants to get on. The professionals want to get on. They want Game of Thrones on their mm-hmm. CV because it's a calling card that that you know the the, the kind of best people this side of the Atlantic have been have been uh, have been working on it. You know, mm-hmm. and so you'd be relieved when it comes out and you can talk about it. Uh, yeah, I've also I, and I also I've been I've been taking I'm kind of the only one apart from the official photographer that has been I've been taking photographs for years on Game of Thrones. Oh, really? Yeah. So I've probably got about three or four coffee table books. Right. <laughs> able able to to do that. So it might be a little pension. Yeah. Down, down the line, but I do have lots and lots of photographs of of, of Game of Thrones that I haven't shown anybody. Right. Mm. And what did you think you were signing up for when you signed up for it? Did you know it was going to be something like this? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'd met them originally for the before it kicked off, before it started, for an, another part. And mm. don't ask, I won't be telling you which part. Um, it just wouldn't be fair to the other mm. actor. But um, in true Hollywood fashion, they came back after I'd met them and said, look, it hasn't worked for you, but we are, on the second season, uh, we have some really interesting characters that we'd like to talk to you about. And that's that's kind of the standard piss off from Hollywood yeah. that, that we, we'll come back to you don't call us we'll call yeah. you so I kind of put it to one side even though I read the script and I thought it was wonderful uh, the original uh, pilot I think mm. it was um, and um, but sure enough they came back a year, a year later and said look we uh, will you come in and have a chat with us about this Davos Seaworth character mm. um, and I'd they'd sent t- uh, 10 DVDs of the first season so uh, I knew. Listen, I knew as soon as you read it. I've been in the game long enough that it was just, it was almost faultless. The script when I right. when I read them, it's just beautiful storytelling. So sure enough, they came back and we had a chat and off we went for because uh, I came in at the beginning of season two. Yeah, and did you? How much of yourself did you bring to him then, as like as a character and uh, evolving him as a character? Well, because uh, you know it's unusual because you you know when you're doing a movie or whatever, you sometimes. You can start with the 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 last day of filming, mm. depending on locations and actors' availability and all that sort of thing. And with a series like that, it's it's kind of chronologically rolled mm. out. So there was a certain amount of I mean, at the beginning, I was like in four episodes and and you know popped in and popped out because the whole that, that the Stannis Melisandre Davos mm. thing was was being introduced. So it was introduced gently, but as we as we went on. Um, I hear that the, the producers and HBO liked what I was doing, mm. so they expanded the role a bit and all that. Whatever, that's for other people to comment on. Uh, mm. like, I don't want to either appear to be blowing my own trumpet or or getting it wrong. Yeah. Ask other people about that. Will you miss it? 
Uh, I'll miss the money. Uh, <laughs> no, I will, of course, miss it. It's, these things only come, out, come along, you know, it's a bit of a unicorn. But they, they should, as with all these things, they should have a beginning, middle and an end. Yeah. I mean, we've all seen series that kind of outstay their welcome. And, and this thing had a, uh, has, a, has I won't say a shelf life, but, you know, at the end of this, if, you know, if we don't make a mess of the last season, it'll be rediscovered in 10 years, 20 mm. years, five years, whatever it may be. It's, 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 it's undoubtedly a classic, you know, so... Uh, but and they're very very difficult to find. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, the d- I I I will miss. I'll miss the perfect storm, which is th- the best crews, the best costume people, the best prop people, the beautiful scripts, the attention to detail, the the wonderful casting, um, all that. You could you could get a sense of that when you were doing it. It's it's kind of very unusual. Even when you're working on a practical level, you walk onto a set that's incredibly quiet, incredibly together, and mm. people working. There's no headless chicken stuff, and you just go in, and it's like a flick of a switch when you're going for a take. It's just everybody comes together, and that's kind of magical. It's what every production aims for, but very few pe- very yeah. few productions actually hit. Um, talk to me a bit about your upbringing because you mentioned there when the, on the St. Patrick's Day parade mm. representing your you know your socio-economic <laughs> bracket bracket <laughs> yeah but talk to me about growing up in 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 Dublin uh your father worked on the docks yeah he Docker. was he was he was Marlon Brando and on the waterfront well, he, was, he was a button man was he, he was a button man yeah what, what button is a button man the, well you basically uh, <sighs> <coughs> basically you got your father had a, a, a button and a, a, as you went on there was a, there, a, there, there's various interpretations of it. But there was a time when the kind of guy, the, the the boss, would literally have a handful of buttons mm. and throw them out, and men would pick them up off the ground and get a day's work. Yeah. Uh, that that's what happened when when the employers towards the end of when when my dad um, was coming to the end of his time as 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 a docker, uh, when the docks were transforming. Uh, and the dockers weren't treated terribly well when he would show up in the morning would go there at eight o'clock and wait to be called out mm. uh, and and would com- come home uh, and go no look today uh, when they were yeah they were basically devalued these hard-working men mm. and I I remember at the time thought there was an incredible in- indignity to that um, and also it was kind of around the time that I was a punk as well yeah so there was a certain amount of raging against the machine, yeah. um, and that and that I think for, that possibly formulated something in the in the back of my head. Well, maybe not in the back of my head that I wasn't going to end up like that. Um, and I, I I actually ended up becoming an electrician mm. uh, by by mistake. Uh, there was two guys I was I was working home in secondary school with, and they they took took a left into an ESB showroom. Uh, and I, 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 where he's going, there were two mates of mine. Said, "Oh, there's application forms for, for apprentices." Mm. Uh, and I picked one up, and me ma found the application in my school bag, right. and went, "What's this?" And and basically made me fill it in. I pulled it off. I got an interview, and I ended up being an electri- mm. electrician. It wasn't any ambition that I had to be one, but I loved working in the ESP, and it, the apprenticeship was great. And I was working with older guys, and uh, I think the apprenticeship system is a very civilized way of. I mean, it goes back thousands of years. Mm. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, and a, it's a dignified life. It's a, you know, it's a trade. Um, and uh, and I did that for the best part, including my apprenticeship, about eleven years. Mm. But so did your father have a? Did he have a, like that instability, that uncertainty? Was that? Did that get worse? Like, uh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he became unemployed, and mm. and and he, um, you know, he was given a, a small amount of redundancy money when he left which he duly put through his liver right um and uh and we didn't have we didn't have much and i, I listen this is not the four yorkshire men thing i had yeah. i had i had a, a i had a, an absolutely textbook gorgeous childhood without much money yeah um, but i you know when i was younger we'd moved from the center uh, yeah. city center out to out to um out to the countryside which is now called kulak <laughs> um 
And uh, what was that like? The, that move that must have been a big thing. Oh, no, it was extra. It was extraordinary. It was you know it was a half built. You know we came in quite early in the building of the McInerney homes and whatever. And so I had you know I lived in a lovely um, corporation house, and uh, and we had a half built mm. estate around the place yeah. to ex- explore. Um, there was countryside, and you know there was b- beside us there was fields of wheat. This is a time when actually the governments and local authorities built we're houses. We're building social building housing houses, for yeah, people who yeah. needed it. Yeah, they were building talent yeah. for the the people still in the tenements yeah. in, the, in the middle of town, and that was being built in Plundarkin and mm. all that sort of thing when, when governments had a bit of vision mm. um, and uh, and did what they were supposed to do. Um, and, uh, and, and I was a great beneficiary of that, mm. um, as a lot of families were. Um, and it, it, it was fantastic. <laughs> Um, so uh, uh, even though uh, you know I, I ended up working a, a, as a, a lounge boy or a you know a waiter or whatever they call it in the pub, uh, and I did that from the age of thirteen, and it, and it, it, that put a few manners on me. And was your dad still working in the in the docks at that? Uh, yeah, on and off. Yeah, he became yeah. a crime driver and stuff. Right, I mean, okay. we were all right for years. Yeah, yeah. You know the bills were paid and all that, but we had we had moments of of insecurity. But but I had a really stable family life and a fantastic. My mum's still around and she's a, yeah. a goddess. Uh, so I can't claim to have hugely suffered. No, but that sense you say of like that, not wanting to have that instability or not have that sort of dependency on somebody turning up each day and somebody giving you work. Like yeah, I didn't. I certainly didn't want to work for the man. Yeah, I I didn't like that at all. When I I think that was certainly part of. Um, I mean, I'm not. I'm far from a hero because I had me trade when I decided to change from an electrician to an actor. I I still have me box of tools. Mm. So I had my fallback position, yeah, uh, and uh, they weren't, gonna, they, you know, nobody was going to take that off me. I had me pieces of paper saying I'm, I'm a qualified tradesman. Um, so, but at the same time, I, uh, I want, and I still do. I still, uh, I, I, that's the way I keep my life relatively simple. And um, is that I, I, it, it the, one of the greatest luxuries is, is I can tell whoever I want to to go and fuck themselves, right. uh, and that's that's that's. Uh, that's a, a luxury that a lot of people with a lot more money or status than I do mm. who, who haven't got that luxury. I do. Uh, uh, and, and time, I have I like to take a lot of time off. And I, I, I to a, a certain degree, I can work when I want to mm. work. I mean, I'm not in any position to retire or anything like that, but I could certainly take a couple of months off and, and whatever and have a little bit of a emergency fund, yeah. rainy day fund that I can... You know, and and to a certain extent, I can. Now, I won't say do what I want because you, you, you nobody does. But uh, but it's it's the trying to hold back for some d- a decent script to come in as as much as I possibly can, and that's probably the reason I'm not a multi millionaire because mm. I I want to feel I'm a little fussy. But uh, was that sense was the apprenticeship uh, like an attempt at that point in your life to kind of say right I, this is something that is stable like there is a career path that or there is a kind of you know because you ended up in the ESB and you got yeah. a kind of permanent job that was oh it was a certain step my, my, my dad was you know t- uh, semi-skilled yeah and I was the first uh, uh, guy in my family immediate family and and a little bit around that as well uh, who actually had a trade who became a skilled yeah. person you know so so from that that position it was mm. I had the so-called grand secure job and is that what you wanted at that point it was it was uh, yeah. Well, I wasn't ambitious. Mm. I, I, okay. I I wasn't or spontaneous or or any of that. And it was it, it kept me busy. It gave me a wage. It, it kind of I, I, it it wasn't. Uh, I got a job because somebody told me I should get a job. Right. You know. But and you creative like music was a, your kind of passion at that time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, re- music. Yeah. Re- well, it was kind of it it was symbolic of the rebellion. Right. Uh, and the music was the was the language that was yeah. used, you know, the whole punk thing and 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 the the pistols and the clash and the jam and all that. And they 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 were, they were speaking to the youth. Yeah. And I was uh, my my timing was good. I grew right. up just as that was that was hitting. And I. And who did you see? Who did you see in dub? Did you go? Oh, to I, I I was spoiled rotten. Yeah. I I I, you know, I, even apart from the punk thing, and I I, I saw. Bob Marley's one uh, last, right. well, allegedly last ever concert, which was in Daily Mail. Yeah, yeah. 
in, with the whole proper Bob Marley and the Wailers and right, Wailers right. And, and Rita and, and the same year I saw the original lineup of the Ramones and the Cabra yeah. and the Star Cinema and Cabra and stuff like that and I was at in I was at the Dark Space Project when you two were were, mm. were doing Ramones covers and yeah yeah uh, uh, and uh, all sorts of people and Mekons and uh, uh, all sorts of people at that that stuff and it was yeah that that was just as I started my apprenticeship in ESB mm. it was down the road it was in Fleet Street right yeah you yeah. know uh, the, the Project Art Centre where it was on and the other end of the street I was doing my apprenticeship in ESB right. which is now right. a Tesco I right think. yeah yeah yeah. And then you went out to Africa. You went to Zimbabwe. Eighty four. I went to Africa. Yeah. Uh, and what, what, what? How did that come about? Um, I'd never been anywhere. I I I was a motor. I, I was on motorbikes at the time, and the, the most adventure I'd ever done was a week's holiday in Scotland on a bike. Uh, and then um, I had the opportunity a few years, a couple of years after independence when Rhodesia became Zimbabwe when when all the whites were leaving uh, in 1980 there was a quarter of a million whites in Zimbabwe and and four years after independence there was 50,000 left um, so whatever that is 80 percent 75 80 percent of the white population that made a run for it and of course they'd kept all the um what do you call it the, the good jobs for themselves so and uh, they hadn't got uh, uh, people to run their electricity networks and mm -hmm. that's what I kind of did with high voltage stuff so they came over the Zimbabwe government came over and, and we're looking uh, for people to go over and at the time the economy wasn't great here and all the apprentices not my year the year after me were being let go after they f f served their time right. and um, so I went to the management and, and, and said look if I uh, if I show me face for this, um, will you hold the job open for me? And they said, yeah. So I I uh, I went over there for three and a half years uh, to uh, to Zimbabwe in the early, in the early mid eighties. Mm. And was that did that change how you felt about what you were doing? Yeah, yeah. You, I'd never been anywhere. My right. first time on a plane was going over to Africa, really, right. which was really odd. Yeah. Uh, so I went over there, and then I was thrown out. I was I worked in the bush. I didn't. Yeah. I wasn't work. I was in Harare, the capital. For a few weeks, and then uh, then we were sent out into the into the void, into the <laughs> deepest, darkest Africa. And it was fantastic. Yeah. It was absolutely complete culture shock, eye opening. Um, I got to you know uh, live in a place that was in inc incredibly alien, mm -hmm. uh, and and a, a bit scary, but in a, in a good way. And uh, um, I got got down and dirty with the with the with the uh, indigenous population over there. I love them. I still go back. I have to. I'm, I'm magnetically drawn back to Africa. I've Are just you? been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just. I've yeah, just. Twenty yeah. second of December. Yeah. I've just come back. Are you like a mission? Like my uncle is a was a missionary priest out mm. in Africa, and he essentially considers himself kind of African. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know I can I mean? understand yeah. it. You can get. I think it's like foreigners when they come here after yeah, yeah, five or six yeah, yeah. years, they consider themselves Irish <laughs> because it's almost like a badge of honor. Yeah, yeah. And it's the same. With, it's and the same. In Africa. You felt that, and you felt that a little bit while you were there. That like you felt drawn to it in a way. That absolutely, didn't, didn't absolutely. Leave you. Yeah, yeah. I think Bob Marley was a bit of the, was a bit of a, a, a kind of. A, 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 a language we all sp spoke. They like loved our reggae over there. Yeah. Of course they do, uh, and uh, so the music and all that sort of thing was drawn to them. Yeah, I did kind of get ostracized by the white population not long after I got there because I was, uh, uh, yeah, I was I was drinking in the. Uh, there's no pubs over there. It's kind of you know these clubs, mine mm. clubs and hotel. So yeah, when the uh, local white asshole racist population kind of discovered I was. Uh, mingling with the locals uh, I was kind of slightly uh, I was slightly uh, uh, pushed to one side as uh, really oh yeah, yeah yeah I was appalling the racist ones yeah, you've yeah. you've uh, you've no idea whether the, the racism like it's it's, it's but it's, you were ostracized for for yeah, so, so for associating yeah 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 that I was that I wasn't uh, uh, treating them like employees and and mm. uh, and whatever uh, I just listen they were the people with the marijuana <laughs> <laughs> there, there was that as well. So yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I used to drink in the townships and all that sort of stuff. It just yeah. it ain't no big deal, but you know, but I, I but they, they were just so Victorian. It was just yeah, so old fashioned. Yeah, yeah. The, the thinking was just like what nuts. I didn't get it. I still don't get it. 
And when you you came back then after three three and three and a half years. Yeah, in eighty seven I came back, yeah. And so you came back to a pretty thousand de- years ago. Pretty pretty depressed Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't great. Actually it's interesting I, I, I kinda got my first good break. Uh, and again, th- again th- the whole African thing is really weird. It'd almost make you spiritual and religious. Um, I'd come back and when I started doing the acting course, and basically I, I did this play, the first kind of lead I did after I'd jacked the job. Um, I was doing electrics for um, my head teacher in, in, in acting school, and I was going around to Cl- Clondalkin and Talent mm. various places, putting this um, play called The Lament for Arthur Cleary. And it was about a bloke who'd been living away for a number of years and he was a biker, Dublin working class, right. blah, blah, blah. And he, he's been away for years and he comes back to a Dublin that is full of money lenders, drug dealers and blah, mm. blah, blah. Uh, and the, the guy who was playing the lead, Brendan, Brendan Laird, fine actor, um, he got this really nice gig uh, with John Hort, who bombed Birmingham about the Birmingham mm. sick. So he was leaving the play and I never really did anything before that and uh, the director uh, was obviously wasn't happy he was going to lose his leading man and then I got offered the role because I'd lived the research right and I I'd, I'd seen the play loads of times and uh, obviously because it was uh, and he was uh, you know the director of the play was my year head in acting school uh, and they offered me the gig so and and for Probably five years after that, I was in the right place at the right time, or somebody fell out of something, and yeah, I yeah. stepped in, and I did a couple of red Adair jobs, and and uh, and it's th- that's kind of how I formulated getting experience from from people, not because I was marvelous, because they were stuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you were there. You <laughs> were really <laughs> blowing me on trouble here. I'm very You're well. Not really. <laughs> no, no. But uh, but I I built up a you know a CV that way. And when did you stop working? In the ESB, I uh, in nineteen eighty nine. Right. Well, how soon after you were getting work as an act? Like, did no, you? No, no, I wasn't getting any you work. Getting anything? No, I. I so I, that part came after you'd you'd packed in the ESB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I, I did two years, uh, weekend and evenings, uh, uh, while I was still working in the ESB. I couldn't afford to take the time mm. off. I, you know, wife and a fucking mortgage. Yeah. So I, 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 from Monday to Friday, eight to five, I was doing uh, my ESB work and then five nights a week and on mm. weekends I, w- I was uh, I was doing the acting thing and then uh, the int- that was what's the interesting thing the funny thing was when I'd handed in my resignation mm. uh, they, they, there was a, when anybody was leaving or retiring they, 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 there was always a drinks thing yeah and I was based down at South Lots, South Lots Road you know mm. next to the dog park the ESB yeah, yeah. place there that was my base and at the back of that is the sports co. I don't know what it's called now, but it's the ESP um, social Re- club, yeah. uh, and that's where we had so-called uh, retirement drinks. But I'd resigned, so uh, the day or the week I was leaving, one of the lads I worked with says, "Have you seen the notice board?" And I went, "No, I haven't." He said, "Come here," uh, and uh, and on a, a little A four photocopy thing said please come and join us at six o'clock or five o'clock on friday evening uh for drinks on the uh, occasion uh, they weren't going to put resi- resignation mm. it's a dirty word really and they put on the occasion of the retirement of liam cunningham <laughs> uh, I, I was 29 i retired at 29 <laughs> so i mean i immediately put a smile on my face <laughs> Retired at twenty nine. It was like it was an accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. So you were into the, into the life of retirement. You've yeah, been retired. I retired at twenty nine. Right, amazing. I have it on a piece of paper. Yeah. Well, it was on the board somewhere, and I kind of looked at it and kind of went, "Wow!" That, and it was kind of weird seeing that A four page with those words written on it. I remember thinking, uh, "You know, there was that much of fear, and the other bit was a finger up to the." And you felt you had to do it. Oh, I had no choice. I had yeah. to. I, I. It just in my head. I had no yeah. choice. Um, and it wasn't. It wasn't like uh, you know. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. You know, tear the world a new asshole or yeah. anything like that. I wasn't attacking the uh, the norm or anything. It was like if I didn't do, I love doing it. Yeah. 
I, I wasn't doing it because I, I had a, a great plan. I was literally looking for a distraction because I got bored with the job and, 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 and the acting thing, drama, hobby, mm. would, uh, would, would satisfy my, my boredom. But it wasn't like that. I kind of fell in love with it when I started doing it and kind of was like a smack in the mouth. So I, um, uh, I just, I, I had no choice. I, mm. I, after the two years and, and a few people in, in the school telling me, mm. you have to, you have to go for this. Uh, I, I had, it, it was, it was, I wasn't worried about the then. I was, if I had stayed in the ESP, I was worried about 10, 15 years later. Mm. What could have been? What if I had, of? I didn't want to, the f- it was the fear of regret yeah. that made me go for it. I was watching the Billy Connolly program last week. Yeah. He was talking when he went to leave the shipyards. He, yeah, was, he was only there for six months. <laughs> <laughs> Did you Fuck see that? Sense. He's brilliant. Yeah. I've, I've seen him on stage but over said, the years. But he said the same. He said the exact same. He said if somebody in the shipyard said to him, another guy said, I've seen people who could have left mm. and didn't. And they spend the rest of their it's life. It's cancer. Re- yeah. I was afraid of cancer. He says, vaping yeah. on a cigarette. <laughs> uh, yeah, I th- that's what I was, I was, it was the fear of not knowing. Yeah. And that was kind of, that, that, that was kind of scary. And I felt like I, again, I had the box of tools yeah. uh, and uh, I, I could, f- I could fall back on the, as, uh, as it's known, the ground secure job. Um, I was fearful of that. But you were, you were retired from the ESB. You mm. were giving up this secure job like mm. that coming from you know where you'd come from and that instability was that something that concerned you concerned your family no i was really selfish oh no my dad i remember i, I remember uh my dad can I address him uh, uh i was saying to me mrs at the time i'll have to tell him i knew he was going to be disappointed because mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, i i, I he he boasted uh, uh, i'm sure uh, many times uh, to his mates about son to the esp and all that uh and i'd I'd walked into my folks' house. I couldn't really face him, so uh, his 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 c- kind of armchair was just inside the door. So I was kind of looking over his shoulder. I was, I was trying to muster up the courage. He was a big man, mm. uh, and he knew I was doing the acting, and I, uh, he knew something was coming. And he was reading his newspaper, uh, and I said, uh, "Tell you know the acting thing, yeah." I, I said, "I'm gonna go. I'm jacking in the job." I just blurted it out. And uh, he didn't even move his head. He was just looking at the newspaper and he just, he said the following uh, three words. For fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I launched into a, an immediate overreactive defense. Well, what do you expect me to do? It was like I was, I, I turned into a seven year old. Yeah. Um, but, um, but he did, he did, uh, he saw a little bit before he, before he passed away. He saw them doing a couple of things. And when did he pass away? Uh, it's the time years the Twin Towers came down. What's that? It was, uh, 2001. It, yeah, t- 2001, yeah. 18 years ago now. Right. Yeah. So he'd seen some... He'd seen, he'd seen a few bits and pieces that I did. Yeah, he started to be... He he wouldn't tell anybody that I was breaking me bollocks on the Abbey stage or anything like right. that and, and, and trying to do uh, uh, my theatre work. But uh, as soon as I showed up in an ad for a German beer on RTA, he was telling all his <laughs> mates then. Then I was an actor because yeah. I was on the telly. And was he proud of you? Like you said, he was proud of you being in the SB. Was he proud of, of what you were doing? I don't think he. I don't think he ever forgave me for give, jacking in the job right. uh, and thought it was it was um, some Oscar Wilde affectation. Yeah. Or, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he saw it as a viable. It was so alien to him. Yeah. You know, and his and his 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 growing up. But you had picked like the most insecure profession of the oh, lot. Oh, stupid really. move. Yeah. yeah. On, a, on, a, on a spreadsheet, it's a it's a stupid thing to do. Yeah. But you know. It's like the who dares wins, you know. Yeah. Fortune favors the brave. I didn't. I didn't view it like that. I didn't kind of go. There was no five year plan. You can't. You know, people say you have a great career or whatever. And you can't. Have, you don't have a career. You go. I go job to job. If something interesting comes in, there's no grand plan. It makes sense looking back. Or does it, it looks good yeah, in, yeah. in retrospect. It, it probably looks good, but but naivety is a wonderful thing. Mm. I was. I was like genuinely. You know. I was. I'd seen three or four plays before I started acting and. <laughs> It was. It was. I found it genuinely fascinating looking at a piece of Shakespeare, and not not from a a literary point of view. Mm. It, it was the the problem solving of getting this believable, interesting, mm. manageable, entertaining. I, I, those processes. Yeah. I find fascinating. 
And early enough, you were doing like what you were in the Royal Shakespeare Company. Or it was every year and a half, yeah. And how was that? It was a fucking pain in the arse. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, <coughs> now, some of it, one of the best things I've ever done in my life was there because a play called The Herbal Bed, mm. which I did with David Tennant and Joseph Fiennes and, and just wonderful people. And, uh, and then I did a rather mediocre, as you like it. Uh, and uh, that w- that was really scary. I was opening the season, uh, for um, and I just I uh, not only that I was a little bit of a draw. I had a bit of I put my head pops up occasionally, uh, and I just done Cracker. I don't know if you remember mm. Cracker from years ago with Robbie Coltrane, and I'd also done a movie with with um, Kate Winslet and Michael Winterbottom called Jude. Uh, so and that that done pretty well in, in Cannes and places like that. And it was a very art house piece. Of, um, and I'd also got the the um, the popular popular thing covered, the cracker. And they came out mm-hmm. at the same time. So I got the art house covered and the popular thing covered. Uh, and I remember sticking in my guns at the time and said, I'm, uh, the next, I'm doing the next good thing comes in and I don't care what it is. I have to stick to me. I had to have a, a chat with myself because there was a lot of stuff coming in and it was a, a lot of shite. And then unfortunately this, King Royal Shakespeare Company came arriving and this play was beautiful, this herbal brand new play, never been done. Uh, and I, I'd, I'd read it and, and cursed it because I had an opportunity to make money, but this was the best thing that came in. Right. <laughs> and uh, I had to do it, but to do that, I had to do a Shakespeare play as well, which, okay. so I was literally opening the season with this huge speech that, the, at that, Orlando has at the be- at the beginning of it, so um, that's that that's the f- first time I'd I'd ever experienced uh, panic attacks. Really? Yeah. While I was rehearsing that, horrific, horrific uh, panic attacks because I I just thought I've decided to do this and I'm about to th- ruin my own career. It wasn't. Is that gone. how you felt? That's how you felt about oh, it. That's how it. Yeah, that's absolutely how I felt. I was I was rehearsing, but no money thing. And, uh, yeah, I was starting with my sister in Camden and uh, in our spare bedroom. And uh, yeah, that was when rehearsals weren't going well and and, uh, uh, and I didn't seem to be getting it. And what, was, what, what wasn't what was going well about it? Everything. Right. Uh, yeah, all the Shakespeare uh, stuff. Just finding a way through it. Yeah. I had, uh, I didn't like what they were doing with it. I didn't feel that what I was doing was making clear the iambic pentameter, you know, mm. the, was the there a very ritualized, formalized way? Like, was did you encounter that kind of very formal sort of? Conservative I, enc- approach? I encountered the the Ox- Oxbridge yeah. intelligentsia over there. Yeah. Uh, um, the the people who were el- educated beyond their intelligence, mm. uh, and uh, and who had hadn't got a creative bone in their body, but were able to talk until the cows came home yeah. about the academic side of stuff, uh, which is which is not how Shakespeare intended the stuff to mm. be put across. Um, and essentially, I, I found a lot of those people over there who were who were putting on plays to impress their mates, as opposed to yeah. uh, they, uh, there was an arrogance to it that I didn't like, uh, and that kind of brought out the punk in me a bit. And did did you make your feelings clear to them? Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It didn't seem to make much difference. Right. But well, I tried. D- I fought. Uh, I eventually, I eventually got there. How did it go? It was mediocre. Right. <laughs> okay, so that's the happy ending, is it? The happy ending <laughs> is it was mediocre. Yeah, I did, a, I did 171 performances in Stratford and the Barbican of, of uh, As You Like It. But is uh, that, but like, Stratford Street seems to me very much like, again, there is that sense of... Stratford. Yeah, yeah, and there's a tourist element and there's a Shakespeare in the kind of theme park it's, it's element. A, oh, yeah. It's it's that and it's listen it's got a beautiful and and listen at the same time I'm not doing the place down one of the yeah, yeah. one of the jobs I'm m- m- definitely in the top ten of jobs that I did I did there which was the herbal bed uh, beautiful beautiful play uh, but on the other side of it there was there was the uh, the big the l- let's get it on for the tourists yeah the, the, I didn't like that and when did you had you done the Wexford trilogy before that or was it yeah. Uh, yeah, the Western trilogy. Yeah, well, that's how I. That's kind of how I ended up having a, a bit of a career in 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 in, in Britain. Mm. Um, I I yeah, I did the Western trilogy above a pub 
in in Shepherd's Bush, the Shepherd's yeah. Bush, which I'm not doing the place down because it, it was remarkable uh, theatre. Yeah. Uh, it was run by Dominic Drumgoul at the time. I think he's, is he running a globe or something? A, 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 a terrific uh, artistic director. <laughs> and uh, we did Billy Whelan, for them that don't know, the Wexford trilogy is based in, in this beautiful trilogy of plays that are set in Wexford, uh, Wexford Town. And uh, I was lucky enough, to, a magnificent director, I've done five plays with him, I think, uh, called Robin Lefebvre, a Scottish yeah. guy, a uh, wonderful guy. Uh, and I was dragged over uh, they, I was availability checked. Here's the life of an actor. Here's the glamour. Mm. I uh, two of the plays. One of them uh, uh, is called A Handful of Stars. Yeah, uh, and it was a retired be or a beaten boxer that comes back to Wexford and his career hasn't gone well. And the other one that I was in two of the th trilogy was uh, a fella called wonderful guy called Danger Doyle. Mm. Um, Beautiful <coughs> place. Billy Roach a wonderful, wonderful playwright. He's a national treasure as far as I'm concerned. And writes beautifully for women as well. He's, he's, it's just, he's a great writer. Uh, and I was availability checked. And I read one of them and I went, yeah. And I read the second one and I went, I'm too, I'm too young for this. Uh, and I forgot about it. Also, my missus was pregnant with her first child. Okay. So I forgot about it. I came back and went, no, no, we're going to, you're, you're too young for this. Like, no, yeah, fair enough. And I went away. The guy they cast, they had to give the elbow to uh, a couple of weeks into rehearsal. Mm. A couple of precious weeks into rehearsal and they got back onto me. And I turned it down. I mean, Mrs. found out. I didn't really sell her, but she saw it was a bit glum. Um, so uh, anyway, long story short, I uh, was, both of us had a chat and I decided to do it because it was a really great break in, in, in London. Mm. We had a home birth organised, right? Uh, that I'd done all the classes for, and all that sort of stuff. I was supposed to be cutting the umbilical and all that stuff. Mm. And I, um, I was over uh, uh, rehearsing. She was not eight and a half months pregnant, but but the, the the week she was supposed to have it, have my daughter, uh, I was supposed to be off. So it it was tight, right? Uh, and. Uh, but that basically what happened was I was at uh, rehearsals and I, I obviously rang her a couple of times a day, no mobile phones at the time. Uh, and I, f I found out I was a dad in a telephone box outside Shepherd's Bush tube station. <laughs> <laughs> she'd, uh, she'd had my daughter in, in, in the bathroom at home with, uh, with her best mate next door. We had, we, with really? a wife. Wow. Yeah. So the first time I saw my daughter was on video. My my cousin went round with a, one of those cameras, right? Huge JVC pound thing, and uh, uh, and uh, they 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 couriered a, a a VHS copy over to me and my wow. sisters. Uh, yeah, that was weird. That must have been strange. It's, you were telling me. Yeah, it was really odd. So uh, that's the glamorous life of a of a of a committed actor. And were you doing? Because I remember friends of mine did that, did the Wexford trilogy mm. uh, in I remember seeing in, in Kilburn in the tricycle a few years later. Yeah. And that and they used to do one every night and then do all three at the weekends. Yeah, that's what we used. To, we yeah, we broke it up. There was two, it, it, basically on the three plays it was two, two and one. Right. And then the three on the on, on yeah, the Saturday. Yeah. And then they they would be off Monday and Tuesday. So the yeah. last play they did was a Sunday night, and then it was straight across the road to the Black Line. Yeah, yeah, I did a yeah. bit of that. Yeah, yeah. Because I did Cavalcaders, another Billy Rhodes play, and we yeah. used in in the Trite yeah. in London, beautiful play, uh, and we used to do the same thing across the road. Yeah, for the pints. Yeah, but Billy, like again, he, like he had that music background as well. Yeah, like, yeah, so he's a he musician, had, accomplished yeah. musician. Yeah. So there was an energy in that maybe that you found that you could relate to maybe more than, than like something like you know the, the Shakespearean stuff you were getting very much so I mean you know Billy Vindham you, say, you have a you have a rhythmic thing in your head yeah. and I think you know the best the best plays films and, and TV have a rhythm to yeah. them that, that, that as a punter we find pleasing mm. to go along with this yeah. and if that's broken in any shape or form not in any shape or form sometimes you have to break the rules uh, blah 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 but but there's a rhythm I, mm. If something is written well, there's a rhythm to it, and a rhythm to a speech, a rhythm to a scene, uh, a melody almost, and and that's y yeah, that's why, you know, people like 
Paul Brady and stuff like that tell beautiful stories yeah. with with a rhythm and a melody and a whatever. Yeah. And were you confident in your ability as an actor? I'm still not. No, but no. yet you had this idea where you would only do work that you were you weren't grabbing at work that didn't s satisfy you or looked like it was going to please you. Listen, I had the tax man after me for <laughs> several years. Right. I had to do some work that I yeah. still haven't seen. Okay. Uh, um, uh, so uh, yeah, we've all got a pair of bills. Yeah. So, but I try to keep them to a minimum, hmm. uh, as much as I possibly could. And it it's financially, it's I won't say it's cost me because you don't miss the money you've never seen. But I could certainly, I could certainly have more bedrooms if I'd uh, if I'd have taken some of the jobs. But even you recently. <laughs> But where, but so was was is was what I'm interested in is there a kind of a struggle between that sense of like needing work and you know also at the same time going well I'm not going to do if I keep doing things that uh, are, aren't fulfilling it's going to it's going to kind of erode m m me in some way. Oh yeah, there's still well there's still that. Is there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's still that, but uh, there's also on a practical level mm. when you're. Uh, wondering are you going to have the money together for next year next month's mortgage yeah. and your child needs clothes or whatever it may be yeah. when you've been offered when you're not working mm. and something comes in with a quite a few zeros attached to yeah. it and you have to say no um why do you have to say no because it's shite right uh, when when your missus and the children haven't signed up for your yeah your your ego trip right uh, and uh, you you do have to. Uh, it sometimes those calls can be difficult. And why do you know it's the right call to say no? Because some people might think, well, well it's not the right call to say no. Yeah. If you say yes, you can you know have a Mercedes yeah. instead of a Micra in yeah. your in your driveway yeah. or whatever. I mean, not that I don't have a driveway, but uh, uh, yeah, you've got to make those. Uh, calls for the people that you love and also for your artistic, you know, conscience. Yeah. Um it's 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 kind of a, it's it's kind of a weird one. You d you do kind of in a strange way because of my background and youth and all that that I've been handed an opportunity mm. that people might employ me. You do you do I do sometimes qualify it by saying if the if it was somebody else that were was in my shoes what would i want them to do as a uh not a, not even a representative but somebody who's got lucky yeah i i kind of i don't want to piss on the luck uh so so mm. the, the luck is not uh, is not measured in zeros what's it measured in in being able to look in a mirror right to a set, I'm not listen. I'm not hard and fast. I might end up doing Iron Man seventy five for <laughs> two hundred million in a year, and you'll yeah. be going, and you'll be going, Liam. What would that spe that that impassioned speech you gave me about about your artistic credibility? Yeah. And I go, shut up! I'm driving a Ferrari. <laughs> I may do that yeah. this time. I re I I reserve the right to change my mind <laughs> and be completely paradoxical and, and contrary. But you, but you did have times when the kind of the clash was there, like when you were doing mm. the Mummy, and Hunger came along. Like, did you have to insist that, like, you kind of got a break from? I read where you got a break from doing the Mummy. To it wasn't really a break. What was it? <sighs> How did you hear about this? <laughs> uh, I got myself in a bit of trouble. Uh, with uh, Universal Pictures. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I was doing the mummy at the time, and I'd 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 also had a bit of luck with the wind that shakes the barley, and we'd won the Pandora where I and I'd played I'd managed to avoid playing IRA characters because mm. it's it was a bit of a cliche for Irish actors like another IRA character or whatever, but Ken Loach, uh, you can't say no to that man, so that was fine, so I got contacted about doing uh, Hunger with Michael mm. Fassbender. Which is a f you know a film about Bobby Sands, uh, and I'd already my agent said, look, I've got this thing, uh, this director called Steve McQueen. He's never worked with actors, never made a movie, um, a Turner Prize winner, avant-garde artist. 
and he's doing a film about the IRA. And I said, no, you're all right. I've done one, thanks, good luck. <laughs> and I said, no, look, Ender Welch has written a script and blah, blah, blah. Mm. Ender's a f- magnificent writer. So I said, right, give us a look at it. So I read it. And I've one scene in it, and for them that don't know, it's 28 pages mm. of dialogue. It's a, 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 a single scene of 22 minutes long and, and whatever. So I read the script, and I, it's beautiful, beautiful writing. So I said I'll go and meet him. So I'd already committed to doing this, uh, The Mummy uh, 3, Taxman. Uh, so that's not the title of the film, not the movie Three Taxman. Just no, to be no clear. well, <laughs> in my mind, it sort of was. Anyway, uh, uh, so I'd gone off, and I, I told him on on board that I I'd, I'd met Steve in London, and he's fantastic. He's uh, he's an artist, absolute artist, and you want to work with an artist. So the trouble I got myself in, the the, the I was booked to film in Montreal for a month, mm. and then I was to go to China in November. So I was off for September and October. So they basically came back and said uh, they didn't have a date when they were getting the finance together for hunger, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it came down. They came back and said, look, it's uh, we're going to be doing it in early October. I think it was. Mm. So uh, as an act of courtesy, because it, I was being sandwiched by the two portions of the mummy, I, um, uh, I said, look, we better p- p- uh, send a courtesy email to the other production mm. i.e. Universal and The Mummy uh, saying I'm booked to uh, blah blah and I'd already told everybody on set that I was doing it mm. and they were saying sounds really interesting blah 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 they were all great producers director this that and the other uh, and except that the film company's <coughs> business department business affairs mm. uh, came back and my, my agent ran me up and went uh, look you're going to have to say goodbye to hunger and I went excuse me I said I'm not working so there's a whole legal thing, there's this uh, film bullshit, uh, of insurance. Mm. They get worried. So they said, they're happy for you to do it. However, they will need an, uh, an insurance from the other production in case you get hurt on it, blah, blah, blah. So the, because the budget of the mummy was 160 million, uh, it, the, the insurance premium was about half the budget right. of hunger. Yeah, yeah. So I said, they're not getting that. So my agent uh, said, "You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to drop the hu- hunger." I said, "I'm not dropping it." it uh, this is where I got on my artistic high mm. horse. Mm. It doesn't happen often. I'm not blowing my own trumpet. It, it, this was ten years ago or whatever. So uh, I said, "Look, fire it off. Tell him I'm doing it." And they said, "Look, you're not doing it." My agent, and uh, listen, her relationship with Universal mm. is, would be very important. Yeah. She's a number of clients. Yeah. Blah blah blah. Anyway, <coughs> as it went on. I uh, just basically uh, rang my agent one day and said, look, I'm ta- you need to ring Universal and tell them I'm taking this out of your hands. Uh, I said, uh, oh, you have to keep in mind, sorry, you have to keep in mind that I, I'd filmed for a month in, in mm. Montreal. Half my performance was done. Yeah. So I kind of had them by the balls. Right. So I, I instructed my agent to, to, to say the following. And I said, you can quote me on this. I said, uh, uh Liam's doing hunger. Uh, you're not getting the insurance premium. And if you've got a problem with that, he's not going to Shanghai. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. Uh, so she, she panicked on the end of the phone and said, Liam, you can't, you, you can't do that. It's, it's, it's like career suicide. And I said, but they'd really got up my back and they weren't being nice about it. And it was these fucking idiot yeah. Wall Street, Ivy League assholes. Yeah. Um, so I don't really have a lot of time for them. So, uh, really? yeah, so I, uh, I threw down the gauntlet to them. Yeah. And uh, my agent, ca- I said, I'm going to bed because uh, it was an eight hour difference. So, give me a shout in the morning. So, she came back and uh, the agent rang me. And I said, Well, how'd you get on? And she said, They sent an email back with, uh, with three words on it. That'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, sometimes you have to. You have to stand up for what you believe in. And that was one of those times. One of those few times. I'm not saying I'm, uh, listen, I'm not, I'm not. Uh, but there was, I mean, like, there was a. I'm not, I'm not Mahatma Gandhi, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, but uh, you d- occasionally but I do get my, I do have a breaking point. And that was, when you went to bed that night, were you worried? No. Were you, no. The damage had already been done. Right. It was shit or bust. Yeah. I rolled the dice and it was to see where it'd go. And were you but I had the, 
Yeah. I don't really, if it was at the beginning of it before I, but I was, yeah. I'd have my performance done. They didn't, they just didn't realise uh, that I had all the power. Yeah. They'd given it to me. <laughs> but it's not something I do lightly. Yeah, uh, because I, you know, I have respect for the process and the fact that they're paying me money and that's a big job. But, but, but that but was they were taking a piss. And that was yeah, and but that was something you separated from the people making making the actual movie. This was the business department. This was the yeah, yeah. I had to, d- and this was an important. I, I, this was important. This was different. Yeah, yeah, it was it was really important. And and uh, you know, when the producers had run me up from hunger and said, "Liam, we have no plan B," I I was. I was just I, I was going to let them down, mm. and I'd already agreed to do something and given my word. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and it wasn't going to what I was doing was not upsetting in any shape or form the other production. Yeah, yeah. So I did have the moral high ground, and I had them by the balls. And do you have a temper? No, not really. No. <laughs> like no. Would you I separate? Ang- being, would you say you're angry about you get angry about things? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I do, I do. I I but I tend to grind my teeth. Right. I I I I do occasionally, but I, I don't. I'm not. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not. I don't really get pissed off. Too. Well, I get pissed off, but I don't. I don't roar and shout. So when you're dealing with something doesn't like have that, have any effect on him. So <laughs> right. I gave it up. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're dealing with something like that, it's it's not for me. It's not for me. I'm you're not a big fan of injustice. Yeah, and that seemed to me pretty. Yeah, I d- I I will try and go the extra mile if there's if there's injustice involved. And I I view that mm. as being injustice, and I. Again, it's not even, it's not even, it's not even that. It's if you let those things go, it's that. It, like we said earlier on, it's a bit, it's a cancer that can mm. be. I can't that, which is why I kind of do the thing with the refugees yeah. and all that. It's, it's. Um, I got sick of looking at the telly and going, yeah. "That's awful! That's awful!" So you, at, at least you know the little bit I do. <laughs> if we all do a little bit, well, I do a little bit. It's th- and that's what I do, and I regard it as a little bit. And if enough people do a little bit. Big bits get done. Where do you think Ireland is in that regard? Because it's two and a half years since that late late show appearance where you talked about. Yeah. Uh, that was the Syrian refugees, wasn't it? Yeah. That time? Yeah. Um, two and a half years, Jesus. Um, like, did you, when you did that again, that that sense of his injustice clearly informed that. Mm. But do you think things have improved? Like the numbers might have improved, have they? But uh, there's approximately uh, 65 million people, I think, uh, have been displaced or are mm. refugees. And it has, in the last couple of years, actually from 2016 to 2017, I don't know what the figures are for last year, it it, got, it went up 10%. Mm. So numerically, things aren't improving. Mm-hmm. I mean, the war may be viewed as, in Syria, may be viewed as, winding down mm. but the, the infrastructure is uh, yeah. is ridiculous uh, and and it's not livable so there's still a huge amount of people who, uh, decent honorable innocent men women and children who are who are suffering uh, the decisions of the west mm-hmm. uh, interfer- interference in in, in 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 their lives and there's a, a, a and people are suffering because of it mm. and uh, and they shouldn't be uh, and we have to disgrace uh, the, the the people who have made those decisions to make those people's lives hell when yeah. they haven't done anything wrong. Uh, and I I I, uh, I can't s- I, I I don't know how anybody can sit back and and uh, uh, and think that's reasonable behaviour. And but and in 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 Irish terms, what do you think of where it is? Because you see what's happening. You see what like. In in Ruski, like the 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 uh, the, oh fire, yeah, the the fire and listen, in you're Donegal. gonna get the reason this stuff makes the news is because it's rare. Yeah, I mean you do you get uninformed, xenophobic, mm. um, idiots, um, usually deprived people who want to uh, blame something. Yeah, uh, and that's uh, it's it's the uh, you know it's Johnny Foreigner coming mm. over and making our lives yeah. when it's nothing to do with them. But is that div- are those divisions on the rise? Because like you, since you did that one on the late, late show that time, you know Trump mm. has been elected. Yeah. Like the fear of the outsider. It's not the fear of the outsider. It's blaming the outsider. Blaming the outsider. And that's that's what it is. It's the it's the the f- the, the people like Farage who are mm. who are blaming immigration and uh, mm. on on the uh, you know uh, your your woes are because of Johnny Foreigner, yeah. and it's just deeply disgusting uh, um, uh, and 
immoral behavior um and uh and 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 people don't want to blame their own yeah. it's the demonization and the de yeah dehumanization of, of, of people uh, it's it's always the first the first act of going going to war uh, is the, mm. the, the the first psychological uh step f for to convince the population um, that uh, your that the government should drop bombs on innocent people is to is to dehumanize them and and, mm. uh, and and that's what these people do and it's it's deeply despicable behavior because you've only uh, it's it's very strange when i started going over and meeting these people in under UNHCR plastic living in 50 degrees mm. centigrade with their 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 beautiful children and their these gorgeous families and it 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 sounds so obvious and probably it, it doesn't say much about my intelligence is that when you sit down and and go oh sweet jesus these people are the same as us yeah. uh, it, 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 we're used to seeing four million displaced you know six million mm -hmm. displaced we think of it in terms of numbers and oh my god isn't that awful you see mm -hmm. swathes of people uh, like blood running through veins walking along roads and stuff but when you sit down and 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 and, and, and you're sitting with a family and and, and the, the father is a a sculptor mm -hmm. uh, who has on his phone to show me photographs of his of his work it's beautiful yeah. work and and while he's talking you're looking at his wife who's looking lovingly at her husband talking about his work and and you can see the love in her mm. eyes for him and you're kind of going this is really scary because these people are are the same as yeah. us yeah and 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 it's that recognition mm. that and you have to remember i mean th here's the irony uh i saw something recently in in world war Two. there was a hundred thousand polish people during second world war were taken in by syria the, 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 there's photographs of it. Yeah. You, can, you can look it up. I think it was a hundred thousand. There was also a huge amount of Europeans went to North Africa uh, as refugees. Mm. I mean, the traffic was going west to east, mm. uh, and the arrogance to say that oh, well, just because the traffic uh, has has reversed, it's gone from east east to west now with Syrian refugees, and and the audacity of us mm. to say not to do it, it's not our problem. Uh, I f I find that to. to for somebody to try and sell me that argument, yeah. uh, that's what makes me clench my fist. Uh, yeah, I find that pretty despicable. How do you feel when you see someone like Trump using like sanctions are coming and using Game of Thrones imagery and, and things like that? It was very difficult not to react to that. Yeah. Um, he's a snake oil salesman. People say, people, they say that people get the government they deserve. Mm. Nobody deserves Trump. Mm. Um, um, it's unfortunate, but it, it 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 shows how weak the rest of them are. I mean, he's Trump is a symptom, mm. um, and if you look at the Republican and Democratic Party, what they're they're doing at the moment, uh, uh, standing up to him, whatever. It's it it th th this is a it's a rich man's club, mm. and 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 if we don't take care of democracy, uh, the people with the money always take the power, and if we don't, you know. Democracy is so much more than putting your ex on a piece of paper. If uh, democracy, uh, what did I say? Democracy dies in, si in silence, isn't it? Or something mm. like that. Yeah, something like that. In darkness. I yeah. say the silence or darkness. It's much the same. Uh, if we don't uh, uh, treat uh, the, uh, the democratic process as a as a jewel that that so-called free people have, uh, it um, it becomes a kleptocracy, or a, mm. um, the 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 rich, the greedy, will will take it yeah. and and use it to their ends, uh, and all we need to do is sit back and do nothing about it, and uh, and and this is what's happening now. So it's 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 getting close. It's getting close to time for a revolution, but it's not not quite there yet. But it'll be brought on not because the left mm. uh, uh, are entitled to. It'll be because. The greed and the capitalists will fuck it up. Before we started tonight, today you said that doing these things it's not good for the work. Yeah. What did you mean? Uh, um, if I'm if I was doing my job properly, I shouldn't be talking to you, because we're uh, there should be a, an an element of uh, of uh, mystery about actors. 
Um, not because we should be mysterious and, and the cachet or the enigmatic mm. quality of that. It's um, our job is to convince people we're not we're not human beings. Right. Our job is to convince people we're supposed to be the person we're supposed to be playing, uh, and this uh, and talking to you doesn't help that. Mm. But I have uh, uh, things to do, advocate on behalf of mm. people, and and that occasionally takes priority to my own selfish pursuits. So that's why I, ha you, you, mm, t yeah, yeah, to get, to get some advocacy and some light on the subject mm. with the with the, with the refugees and with World Vision and the charity and the good that they do, the the, the um, payment for that is is uh, disclosing my bullshit life. <laughs> and does not does bullshit, but yeah, but yeah, it's it's no more interesting or less interesting than anybody else's. Um, do you think there's still the opportunities or the paths for or was there ever for for like working class actors or pe working class people who want to be actors because i know in britain there's been a lot of talk about it's the same here is you know is i couldn't same. get arrested here well i i, I got into jobs by mistake or yeah. they were about working class people yeah. uh, it wasn't until i went over to london that i got invited over to london mm -hmm. uh, and was at the bush theater or the whatever it was or the royal shakespeare mm. company when but it's the it's it's not and I, listen i'm not comparing myself to oscar wilde or or, or or beckett or any of those people but there is a there's there, there's a, there's a trend that we don't we we don't really celebrate our own mm. until we've gone out. And the, re the reason for it is psychological we've got a huge uh, big brother next door to us uh, yeah. with you know who have had a incredible society and produced your Shakespeare's and everybody else and we've tipped our hat to them for mm. whatever 800 years so when you get approval from Big Brother uh, that's when it's okay to approve of them when they're home mm. uh, and I kind of fell in in a small way into that little racket I think uh, yeah so I got approval from from uh, mm. uh, the uh, as Dara, Dara, what's Dara O'Brien calls himself on his Twitter account, Brit Licker, <laughs> <laughs> which is genius. Um, it's, it's absolute genius. But I've a huge amount. I wouldn't have a career without without England and Britain mm. and all that, and the BBC and British Theatre and all that. Um, but I don't really work here very much. I mean, Game of Thrones is up the yeah. north, but but I, I I tend to work in a bit in Britain and Europe. And but here is where you live, like you said, pub, yeah, this pub, is my home. pub culture is what keeps you kind of okay. saying. Yeah, pub keeps me going. Yeah, yeah. No, I love it. I, I, I do. I, and I love the size of the place. And I, I love the fact that what I do, most people don't give a shit about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, there's a healthy, I find a healthy, there's a healthy begrudgery here. <laughs> You're not allowed to get ahead of yourself. Yeah. Um, and and I, I have to... I'm quite attracted to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Liam, that's great. Thank you. Cheers. Nice talking to you.